we are all pretty good, I think, at making excuses. Oh, I must have missed your email. Or, oh, I was too exhausted. You wouldn't believe my day. Or, actually, it was so-and-so who messed that up, not me. Or, it can't be my fault. I just did what I was told to do. Or, I tried to do what, was, what I should, but so-and-so just doesn't like me. Or, it was really your fault for tempting me. You know I can't resist temptation. Or, the classic, he or she did it first. I was just responding to what was done. And look at this way. Romans chapter 2, verse 1 through chapter 3, verse 8 could be called dismantling excuses. Paul is listing, then dismissing the excuses people use to say that they are not accountable for sin. And the big one in chapter 2 was denial. Right? I don't sin. This is what the hypocrites in Romans 2, 1 through 3, and Romans 2, 11 to 24 would say. It's not me who sins. I love the law. I pulled the law. I teach the law. Another excuse we saw in Romans 2, 4 and 5, where people presume that because God is patient and kind, he won't take their sin seriously. That presumption is seen again at the end of chapter 2, where the person who relies on ritual says, I may sin, but because I'm part of the covenant, God will dismiss my sin. And Paul answers all of these objections back in chapter 2. But in chapter 3, the objector takes the excuses to a higher level, essentially saying, I may sin, but it's God who's unjust in holding me accountable. The objector excuses himself by accusing God. First, if circumcision is of no value, then why did God do this whole Jewish thing and put me under the law? And second, if my sin is just a tool that God is using to show his righteousness in his judgment, why isn't God himself the one who's being unjust here to use my sin that way? These last two excuses will be dismantled in Romans 3, 1 through 8, where Paul reminds us that we can't shift the blame to God. We can't shift the blame for our sin to God. I'm calling this sermon God in the Dock. That's the name of a famous essay by C.S. Lewis. In this short essay, C.S. Lewis reflects on the difficulties of evangelism in his day specifically the opportunities he had with squadrons of the Royal Air Force during World War II. And he says this, The greatest barrier I have met is the almost total absence from the minds of my audience of any sense of sin. He expands on this by saying, The early Christian preachers could assume in their hearers, whether Jews or pagans, a sense of guilt. And Lewis's own study of pagan religions showed a common thread, people trying to assuage their sense of guilt in different ways. But, Lewis says, because these hearers understood guilt, the Christian message in those days was unmistakably the evangelium, the good news. It promised healing to those who knew they were sick. Now, he says, we have to convince our hearers of the unwelcome diagnosis before we can expect them to welcome the good news of the remedy. He says, ancient man approached God, or even the gods, as the accused person approaches his judge. For the modern man, the roles are reversed. Man is the judge. God is in the dock or the witness stand. Man is a quite kindly judge. If God should have a reasonable defense for being the God who permits war, poverty, and disease, he is ready to listen to it. The trial may even end in God's acquittal. But the important thing is that man is on the bench and God is in the dock. And like so much that Lewis wrote, this recognition was prophetic. Recently, we spent a whole summer defending God against what Rebecca McLaughlin called 12 hard questions for the world's largest religion. Each of these is an accusation against God, where people contend that God should be found guilty. God is on the witness stand. He should be found guilty 
for these things? Doesn't God crush diversity? Doesn't religion cause violence? Hasn't science disproved Christianity? Doesn't Christianity denigrate women? That's your fault, God. Isn't Christianity homophobic? That's your fault, God. Doesn't the Bible condone slavery? Your fault. How can a loving God allow so much suffering? Your fault, God. How can a loving God send people to hell? These are accusations. And the same kind of thing is happening in Romans 3, 1 through 8. God is on trial and mankind, people, are the judge. Everything in this text is an attempt to shift the blame for our sin and the accountability for our sin to God. We can learn a lot by studying how Paul answers these objections. So our outline is very simple. The first question in verses 1 through 4 is basically, if all these things we've just said are true, why did God bother with the whole Jewish project? And the second question in verses 5 to 8, if our sin displays God's righteousness, isn't that use of our unrighteousness unrighteous on God's behalf? No, we can't shift the blame for our sins or God's judgment to a flaw in God. That's Paul's point. So let's read Romans 3, 1 through 4. Then what advantage has the Jew? What is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Paul has been showing his Jewish and legalist readers that the law does them no good unless they keep it. And they don't keep it. Furthermore, rituals, such as the circumcision, which makes you part of God's covenant people, rituals are of no value if you don't also keep the law and you don't keep it. He said that to them already. Now, puts the wor- now Paul puts the words he expects to hear in the mouth of his debating partner or objector. Well, given all that, what value is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? We might expect Paul to say, no value. There is no value in this. It's all about faith. But he doesn't say that. He says much value in every way. Some commentators, of course, accuse Paul of contradicting himself. And it's true that the Jewish people have no advantage in salvation. It's not by works, even works of the law, but by grace through faith. So there really is no value in the case of salvation. But in many other respects, which is what Paul means by in every way, the Jews have great advantages. Oddly, Paul lists only one here. It may be he intended to give a longer list. He does pick up the thought way on, way down in Romans chapter 9, and he says, they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs. And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So that's a great list of real advantages. But Paul doesn't get there yet. He focuses only on one great advantage, verse 2, to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. This is, as Douglas Moo says, the supreme privilege granted to the Jews. The word oracles is the Greek logia, a general term for words, but mostly used of God's words or his divine utterances. God has spoken to his people by his word, entering into a special relationship with them. This is the great advantage. The Old Testament affirms this, Deuteronomy 4.8. And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all the law that I set before you today? Implied answer, no other nation. Psalm 147. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and rules to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his rules. 
So Paul, with this word oracles, is probably referring to more than just the law. Certainly the law, but also to the prophets and to the promises. In Psalm 119, the psalmist rejoices in God's promise. He calls it a promise. Promise is Psalm 119.41. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Verse 50. This is my comfort and my affliction, that your promise gives me life. Verse 58. I entreat your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. And God's promises, Moose says, are those sayings of the Old Testament in which God committed himself to certain actions. All right, so that's the, the oracles. That's the beauty of the oracles of God. But Moo goes on to point out that at the same time, that language implied a responsibility on the part of Israel. God entrusting his oracles to Israel implies and requires a response of submission and obedience. So given that God's great gift to the Jewish people was his word and his promises, given that these oracles called for a response, Paul asks another dialogue question. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? So Paul is plainly asserting that there were some of the Jewish people who were unfaithful. They did not respond to God's law in the way that God intended. And we saw that all throughout chapter 2. And we know it from the whole history of the Old Testament. Time after time, despite God's warnings, judgments, and rescues, the Jewish people turned to idols in their worship, to injustice in their society, and to other nations for their security. They were unfaithful to God. They failed to believe God's promises and trust him for their salvation. But their unfaithfulness, Paul says, doesn't nullify the faithfulness of God. Even though the Jewish nation collectively and Jewish people individually failed to trust in the promises and failed to keep the law, God always remained faithful to them. He continued to work out his promises, ordering the life of the nation so that when the time was full, he would send his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law. He was faithful to his great overarching promise that they would be his people, and he would be their God, and he would dwell with them. But in an even larger sense, God is always faithful to his own unchanging character. The unfaithfulness of God's people does not change his faithfulness. As Paul says in 2 Timothy, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So sometimes when Paul asks a rhetorical question, he lets it be a rhetorical question, and he lets it just hang there. But in this case, he feels so strongly that he does respond to the rhetorical question. Can any unfaithfulness of people cause God to be unfaithful? Verse 4, by no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. So the first phrase in that verse is Greek, make anoito, which is a strong negative. No way, no way, literally, never may it be. Such an assertion, even as a rhetorical question, is unthinkable. And the contrast between God's being true and the human being a liar restates the contrast of the previous verse between Israel's unfaithfulness and God's faithfulness. When Scripture speaks of God being true, it's not just that he tells the truth, but that he is reliable or trustworthy. He is true to his word. And while the promise to which God is true is usually his promise of blessing for his people, God's truth is also displayed when he carries out his promise of the judgment of sin. Don't miss that. That's crucial to the argument of this section. God's truth is also displayed when he carries out his promise of the judgment of sin. In Nehemiah 9, 
when the Levites confess the sins of the nation, they say to God, you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, all this judgment, for you have dealt faithfully, there's that word, and we have acted wickedly. God does truth in faithfulness. But Paul says people, by contrast, are liars. People are unfaithful. And that Greek word has a range of meaning that includes unreliable, perfidious, right word, faithless. So this is not just a wish that God would be faithful to his promises and in his judgments. It's a recognition that he is faithful and that everyone else is unfaithful. All have sinned. Paul concludes the verse with an Old Testament reference as it is written that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. So that's a quote from Psalm 51, David's confession after his sin with Bathsheba when Samuel came to him and said, you're the man. So after his sin, after the murder of Uriah, David finally confesses, and in verse 4 of that psalm, he says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Now, the English Standard Version translates the last phrase, prevail when you are judged. But it's a tough call on that translation. Other versions translate it, prevail when you judge. You're justified in your words. You prevail when you judge, which better fits the Old Testament original in Psalm 51. But if God is on the dock, if God is on trial here, then even prevail when you are judged makes sense. God will prevail. He will not be found guilty of an offense that would mar his character of faithfulness and truth no matter how loudly he is accused by man sitting on the bench. So in this first section, We've heard the objector ask, is there any value to being a Jew? Yes, Paul says, you've got the oracles, you've got the word of God, but those oracles don't lead to faithfulness among the Jews. No, but the oracles are still true, and God is still faithful and righteous. As anyone who honestly evaluates both God's keeping of his promises and his keeping of his warning, can say. So this train of thought raises another issue, or points to another issue. Doesn't my sin then magnify God's righteousness? Verses 5 to 8. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For then, how could God judge the world? But if through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some peer people slanderously charge us with saying, Paul says, their condemnation is just. While this section may still be talking about Jewish objectors, it has a more universal feel. Paul says, what shall we say? Plural, not singular. So Paul is broadening the conversation here. And this, this group now of objectors are saying, our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God. That's essentially the same thing verse 4 said, that God by his judgment is shown to be right. So Paul Moo points out that Paul is not here talking about God's righteousness in general, his own personal integrity, nor even about his saving righteousness which is what's on the subject in Romans 1.17. But this is talking about God being right when he judges, either in the context of the covenant or more broadly when he judges the sin of all people. When he judges Jews according to the covenant, according to the law, he is being right. When he judges Gentiles according to the law that has been written on their hearts, he is also being right. He is righteous. So don't miss it. Paul is addressing the argument, still hard today, that if our sin is part of God's plan, how can he judge us for it? If God is sovereign and his sin is part, and our sin is part of his plan from the beginning, how can he judge us? Paul goes on. What shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath, wrath on us? 
and he adds parenthetically, I speak in a human way. Is God unrighteous to inflict wrath on sinners when that very wrath reveals his holiness and justice? So we hear forms of this question all the time. How can God send people to hell? How can God allow so much suffering? How can God allow natural disasters? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to innocent people? We need to be sensitive to these questions because real people, hurting people, ask these questions. But we also need to be able to respond. And one of the ways that we might respond is something that I see in all these questions, and that's an assumption about God's sovereignty that doesn't actually conform to what the Bible reveals. These questions assume that God runs people like robots, that there was no such thing as meaningful choice in the life of the world. Therefore, people can't be held responsible, so it must be God's fault. But let me say again what I think is the biblical position on divine sovereignty and human responsibility. First, God is sovereign, and the world runs according to his sovereign plan and purpose. Everything that happens is woven into the plan of creation and the plan of redemption from eternity past. Therefore, for example, God does choose who will be saved. But people are responsible. People can choose to repent and choose to believe. People can also choose to do evil, choose to be rebellious against God, choose to do grievous harm to others, and the choices are meaningful. The choices have consequences. These choices bring the effects of sin and suffering into the world. This is true on the largest scale, where what we call natural disasters are the long-term consequences of Adam and Eve's sin and the changes that that sin brought to what is now a fallen world. This is true in the longest term, where those who choose sin are eternally separated from the God they have rejected. But it's also true in the short term, the shorter term, where horrible sinners who abuse or murder or steal or start wars, or order genocides, these choices start chains of consequences that result in the evil and suffering we see in the world, consequences that have grievous harm to the victims and to a widening circle of people and generations down the road. So God is sovereign, man is responsible, and these two things aren't contradictory. All right, do you see it? On the one hand, God is sovereign and orders what will happen, but people are responsible, and what happens is the consequence of their choices. And this elevates our understanding of God, who is so infinite, so omnipotent, that he can work all the choices people make for good or for ill into his plan without violating their free choice or what some would call their free will. So we can examine all the objections that I voiced earlier and see that in each case, God's sovereign will is working together with the evil choices of people. Natural disasters are a long-term consequence of the fall. Human suffering is almost always a consequence of sinful choices people have made. Hell, as we saw earlier in Romans, is a consequence of a person's choice to suppress the truth about God and live for themselves. So Paul's question, is God unrighteous to to inflict wrath upon us, is answered by the recognition that he's not. We are not robots. We've made the choices that justify that wrath. It would be unrighteous of God not to give us the consequences of these choices. And praise God, in the next chapter, we're going to figure out how he deals with with that. But verse 6, Paul says, by no means, for then how could God judge the world? Is God unrighteous to take our sins seriously? (laughs) No way. To do anything but take 
the sinful choices of free people seriously would be the greatest injustice of all. We want God to hold people accountable for their, for their sins, for the harm and hurt and loss and pain that their choices have caused. If God does not see our unrighteousness, if God does not hold us accountable, then he's the wrong person to be in charge of the world. And if God doesn't have a righteous standard for that accountability, what good would his judgment be? He isn't a fair judge unless our unrighteousness does reveal his righteousness. His unchanging standard applied equally to both his covenant people and the Gentiles. Verse 7, Paul restates the argument again. But if through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? Notice that in this restatement, Paul goes back to the beginning of verse 4, picks up this idea of truth and lies, which we saw were there parallel to God's faithfulness and our unfaithfulness. So the word lie is not being used here in the sense of lying to other people, but in the sense of lying to God, telling him one thing about our life, our faith, or our commitment, and then doing another in the hypocritical way that we saw in chapter 2. But even though we are unfaithful to God, he is true and faithful to us. <laughs> and in that faithfulness, God shows his nobility. He shows his glory. He manifests the perfection of his character. But we have trouble with it. The argument again is, wait a second, if my unfaithfulness, my double-mindedness toward God shows his faithfulness and lets his glory be seen, why should I be judged as a sinner? Aren't I doing an important work by providing a dark contrast to God's glorious light? Why should I be judged for that? Okay, all of you are sitting there thinking at this point, man, these are silly arguments. And they are, but they're arguments that people use. So think about that last one just for a minute. Is God more glorified when his glory is seen in contrast to the darkness of our sin? Or would he receive even more glory when his perfection, a light brighter than white, shines out in contrast to the, to the plain white of human faithfulness? I think God's perfections will be even more apparent in an eternity where they stand out even brighter in the midst of redeemed and perfected people, and where all those people and all his creatures reflect his glories back to him, this will make his glory shine even brighter. In any event, Paul answers the objection by finally, plainly stating its absurdity. Verse absurdity. Verse 8. And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying. The arguments of verses 5 and 7 are summarized. Why not do evil that good may come? God will work good out of this evil that I do. And the simple form of the objection makes plain that this objection is actually absurd. I mean, piling up more and more evil is no way to generate good. It's like you're painting a wall with more and more black paint so that more and more white paint will be needed to cover the black and then rejoicing in how much white paint has been used. All right? You don't paint the wall black if you can avoid it. You don't sin to increase God's, the glory of God's forgiveness. Yet, Paul says, he has been slanderously or blasphemously, the word could be, he has been blasphemously accused of just this kind of thinking. And, and we know that. All right, Douglas Moo says, Paul indicates that the objection to his teaching that he puts here in the mouth of a Jewish objector is one that he's heard before and one more than likely that the Roman Christians had also heard. From the point of view of the objector, Paul's teaching that obedience to the law is not the basis for ultimate salvation, is undercutting morality. There's no reason to be moral if you're not held accountable for your sin. <laughs> and Paul actually does preach this, right? What Barclay, in his commentary, calls incongruous grace. 
grace given without regard to worthiness. And this doctrine does inevitably raise objections about justice. How can God be just and then not punish our sin? Again, Paul doesn't answer it here. He'll give an answer. Just a few more verses into Romans 3. But here he intends the absurdity of the question, of the, the absurdity of the question, why not do evil that good may come to be its own answer? The viewpoint taken by the Jewish objector that because my sin highlights God's righteousness, therefore it would not be righteousness to God for God to punish to me for my sin. I mean, it's just absurd. You can't even say it in a way that makes sense. And yet this charge is slanderously used against Paul and blasphemously used against God. Therefore, Paul concludes, their condemnation is just. Moose summarizes this way. God's faithfulness is ultimately not to Israel, but to his own person and promises. God is therefore righteous, righteous when he punishes his people for their sin, as well as when he rewards them for obedience. But this does not mean, Moose says, that we should excuse sin simply because it always magnifies God's righteousness. Such an attitude brings God's own name into disrepute. And this is what happens whenever we put God on trial. We put God in the witness stand and cross-examine him from the bench, sitting as the judge while simultaneously sitting in the jury box to pass sentence on him. And, and our questions, I mean, some of our most common questions, why is there hell? Why is there suffering? Why is there judgment of sin? We think we're accusing God, but in fact, by those questions, we are highlighting the fact that the responsibility for the evil in the world falls back on ourselves. God is not the sinner. He is the only righteous judge. So God did not disobey in the garden. He kept his word. God did not inflict cruelty and abuse and war and oppression on humankind. Those are choices people have made over and over in every generation. And just parenthetically, I've been reading about World War I, World War II, I'm always reading about those things. The choices people made to inflict such cruel horrors on other people. And it, it just makes me pray all the harder for this situation in Ukraine, which if all these Russian troops go into Ukraine, will be the biggest offensive since World War II ended. But it's, it's people making those choices, people responsible for those sins. It's a, absurd to blame God for the sins of people or to accuse him because he promises just judgment for those sins. Instead, we ought to, ought to fall at his feet. We ought to plead for rescue. And of course, we're the people who have read the rest of the story. So we can fall at his feet we can plead for rescue, and then we can rejoice that though all have sinned and fall short of, glory of, of the glory of God, we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus.